All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the seminar series. So today I have the privilege to introduce one of my friends, Dr. Tanya Basta, who came to us all the way from Ohio. Uh, Dr. Basta received her MPH in Community Health Education from Indiana University and a PhD in Health Promotion Behavior from the University of Georgia. Currently, she is an Associate Professor in the Department of Social and Public Health in the College of Health Sciences and Professions at Ohio University, and is also affiliated faculty <coughs> in the Center for International Studies and College of Communications. She is the Associate Director of the Appalachian Rural Health Institute and Interdisciplinary Health Services and Research Institute, collaboratively run by the Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences and Professions at Ohio University. In addition, Dr. Basta is the faculty coordinator for the MPH program in the Department of Social and Public Health, and she teaches courses on health education, women's health, worksite health, human sexuality, aging, health promotion, and social behavioral sciences. Dr. Basta has over 15 years of combined public health research and professional experience. She started her public health career as a worksite health practitioner, but in the past 10 years has worked extensively with domestic community-based organizations focused on HIV and AIDS. She is currently the immediate past chair of the HIV AIDS section of the American Public Health Association. <clears throat> Dr. Boss's research interests focus on increasing the quality of life among individuals living with HIV and AIDS. The majority of her publications are focused on the mental health status of low-income individuals living with HIV in the United States. Now that she lives in rural Appalachia, Ohio, she's interested in HIV prevention and treatment among individuals living in that region. I first met Dr. Basta at the Fordham Research Ethics Training Institute, and we bonded over our interest in HIV at-home testing. But I will refrain from going into more details of our collaborations, and at this moment say enough, or basta, for those of you who speak Spanish. Today, she will discuss the developing nation within our nation, implications for disease prevention in rural Appalachia. This is a good reminder that we don't have to go too far away to do wonderful global health work. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tanya Basta to UC Irvine. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that great introduction. I'm very excited to be here in sunny California, although not so sunny at the moment. And I'm told this is considered gloomy, so if you want to see gloomy, you come to Ohio and we'll show you gloomy. Gray for days at a time. Um, I'm very excited to be here talking about Appalachia. It's where I've lived for the past seven years. I'm very passionate about the area. Um, and I'm hoping to show you that even though this is a global health lecture series, that we right here in the middle of the United States have a region that has many similar characteristics to countries, um, especially over in Africa, with high levels of poverty, low le levels of educational attainment, and many health disparities. So, a little bit about the Appalachian Rural Health Institute, or AREA as we call it, Ohio University. Um, like Dr. Brown said, it's a collaboration between our College of Medicine and my College in Health Sciences and Professions, and what we really try to do is foster interdisciplinary work to try to incre increase the quality of life of Appalachian residents. And so um, I've been working with, what, I've been co-directing ARI for three years and really focused on trying to get people to engage with the community, conduct community engaged work in the rural Appalachian region. And that is not ARI at the bottom. I know it's a beautiful building on campus. That's where the president's <laughs> office is. So he got just like the most beautiful um, building on campus. So what I'm gonna talk about today I'm going to give you all a tour of the Appalachian region. How many people have ever been to Appalachia? OK, my husband doesn't count. <laughs> uh, uh, and how many of you know where Appalachia is? OK, all right, well, good. So I'm going to give you all a tour first, a little bit about the geog geography and people. And then we're going to talk about some of the leading health issues in the Appalachian region, factors affecting Appalachian health, and then a little bit of um, implications for intervention development, as well as lessons learned from my own research. Okay, so buckle up, here we go. We're traveling all the way from beautiful Irvine, California. It's 2,300 miles traveling over to Ohio, which I know most of you probably had no idea that Appalachia includes Ohio. I didn't when I first went to interview there. In fact, actually, 
I was going um, to interview and people asked me, I was in Georgia at the time, you know, why Ohio University? Why do you want to come to Ohio? And I said, my parents live in Indiana, I was raised in Indiana, I want to get back to the Midwest. And they kind of looked at me with a blank stare and said, this isn't the Midwest. Look on the uh, Great Lakes region, I was pretty familiar with that. I thought it was the uh, Midwest and they said, no, this is Appalachia. And I went, what? Okay, okay, Appalachia, fine. Then I'll, I'm still closer to home. All right, so here we go. We're going to Appalachian, Ohio. If I was going to take you on a tour, I would take you there. Um, of course, you have to fly into Columbus, where there's another university there, the Ohio State University. We are a very different university, Ohio University. And we travel about 80 miles southeast to Athens County, which you can see with the arrow. Let's see, I've got my pointer here. Okay, so here's Athens. Um, Columbus is up here in the middle, so we got to travel southeastern here to Athens County. Um, and if we were traveling down, it's pretty flat for a while, and then all of a sudden when you come into Athens, this is what you see off to the right side of the road when you're on Highway 33. Beautiful college campus nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, and it's just a, it's a picturesque college campus. And so this is what you see. We have about 20,000 students. Um, about 17,000 undergrads, I guess we have a little over 20, about 5,000 graduate students. And we have four regional campuses as well that all are located in Appalachian, Ohio. And I guess I didn't point out very well, but there are 32 counties in Ohio that are considered Appalachian and it's the southeastern um, counties in Ohio that border West Virginia and Kentucky. So there's our main kind of entrance to campus, again, very beautiful. We are the oldest institution in Ohio, founded in 1804. Despite what Ohio State claims, we were the first public institution in the state. And this is our little uptown area, downtown area. We call it uptown because it's north of campus and you go up a hill to get there. So for a lot of college students that come, and most of ours come from the big C's, which are Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland, this is all they see of Appalachia. Okay? They see campus and they see the bars and restaurants of downtown and they never get outside of these walls. However, a mile and a half from campus, a mile and a half, okay, you can walk that, we have people who are living like this. Okay, so um, this is in Athens proper, or like this. And this is actually a very nice trailer. If you travel a few miles further out, there are people still living without electricity, without water, with dirt floors, and we have lots of people living in poverty. So if there's one thing I can stress in Appalachia, there's a lot of disparities. And there's a lot of disparities within Appalachia, but there's many disparities between Appalachia and non-Appalachia as well, and I'm gonna cover some of those in just a few minutes. And this is, by the way, about a mile and a half from our house. So, just, it's very mixed in Athens. So this is the Appalachian region. It's probably a lot larger um, than you may have ever guessed. It goes all the way down to northern Mississippi, which most people don't consider Mississippi to be the Appalachian region, really follows the Appalachian Mountain region all the way up to southern New York. Um, Athens County, here we are, little right there, that little purple one. Um, we are in the north central, the purple region there, and the central region here in Kentucky. That's really the region I'm going to be talking about today when I talk about Appalachian characteristics and um, culture, because this is the area in which I've done my research down in southeastern Ohio and eastern Kentucky, West Virginia area. Um, so we call this the tri-state. We get our news out of West Virginia and Kentucky, so we really consider ourselves to be more, more or less part of the West Virginia, Kentucky, Appalachian region, more so than Ohio, actually. Can I ask a question? Sure. I, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay. So I'm, when I see this map, I'm always curious about that separate column of orange in the middle of Tennessee. That, is that geography or cultural Appalachia? Good question. We're actually going to get to that in a second. Oh, but um, the counties uh, were actually federally defined. So the region was federally defined back in the 60s um, when the war on poverty was taking place and the president was trying to uh, eliminate disparities and try to bring the, the level up to other counties. And so this was actually not defined by people themselves, um, but the government, so that they could provide resources. Exactly. But good question. Okay, so there are 205 thousand square miles that are covered, 420 counties. It's part of 12 states in all of West Virginia. So all of West Virginia is considered Appalachian. And you're probably wondering why I'm saying Appalachian and not Appalachian. Um, I said Appalachian until I moved to the region. 
and I was told that that's how they know if you're not from around there. So you say Appalachian, at least in the in southeastern Ohio, eastern Kentucky, West Virginia area. Um, if you say Appalachian, they know that you're an outsider. Um, however, I have a faculty member from Appalachian, Pennsylvania, and he said up there they say Appalachia. So it's really where you're from. But I'm going to try and say Appalachia. I sometimes forget and say Appalachia, so you might hear both. Federally defined region, just like I talked about, from the 60s, home to 25 million people, follows the Appalachian mountain range, and it really is, even though I'm going to talk about some really kind of disturbing um, statistics today, it is a beautiful area, and the people are beautiful, and the landscape is beautiful, so it's not all that. Just like when you travel to Africa or South America, and we think of a lot of the depressing statistics and the distress, there's um, a lot of beautiful parts of um, Appalachia and living there is, is lovely. I enjoy living there. All right, so some general characteristics of the Appalachian region. Very rural and geographically isolated. 40% of residents in the Appalachian region live in rural areas compared to 20% of the general population. So there are a lot of people living in rural areas. There are a lot of isolated areas. There are counties directly to the south of Athens, Meigs and Vinton County, that do not have hospitals. Um, Benton County only has 12,000 residents, only has one feder federal qualified health center, um, and, but no hospital. So if you're in one of those counties and you have a heart attack, transport times to the hospital are over an hour. So we're talking very isolated areas. And, and we're not as bad in southeastern Ohio as there are in some of the areas of eastern Kentucky um, and Virginia. High levels of poverty. Athens County I live in is the poorest county in the state. I'll show you that in just a minute third of all households living in poverty, half of all children. High levels of unemployment, I'm gonna show you some slides on those in just a minute, low educational attainment as well, and limited healthcare resources like I talked about, but certainly limited access as well. A lot of people don't have cars, or if they do have cars, they don't have gas to put in their cars, um, or they may have to take a really windy road to get there. Um, walking is not possible, there are no sidewalks. Uh, you know, we talk about using physical activity, getting people out walking and they look at, like, at you like you're crazy. Have you walked on one of our rural roads? I mean, people fly by at 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, you will be taken out. So here we go, looking at graduation rates. The dark blue here, or the aqua, are the worst completion rates. So we're looking at 49 to 60% completion rate for high school. Um, and this is the Appalachian Regional Commission. They process this information fairly regularly, although these are the most um, recent statistics in 2009 for graduation. So if you're looking at Eastern Kentucky, I mean, the majority of the region there, only half of all folks are getting their high school degrees. Um, Ohio, we're doing a little better. Athens County, I'll show you in a minute, is a little bit different. We have higher rates. Um, but Southern Ohio as well, around 70, 75% completion rates. Unemployment. Unemployment in this region is just always a problem. You ask people what the number one issue affecting the region is, it's unemployment. Um, we did a study and we um, interviewed people down in these four counties and we asked them, you know, what's the biggest thousand people representative sample, what's the biggest issue facing your community? Jobs. Across the board it was jobs. And you can see high levels, 13.7 to almost 20% unemployment in these blue counties. Um, rates tend to hover right around 10 to 12 percent, kind of in the entire region. So then looking at poverty, okay, see the blue? We're looking at 30 to 42 percent poverty for these counties. This one in Ohio, that's Athens County. That's where, that's where I live, where my kids, where we're raising our kids in the poorest county in the state. And let me tell you, having lived in only urban areas, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and moving to this area, it's very eye-opening and seeing how people are living here. In Eastern Kentucky, you can see very high poverty rates. So, when you put this all together, the Appalachian Regional Commission comes up with an economic status for every county in the region. A lot of red on there. Red is the worst, okay? So they come up with these economic levels. Attainment means you've made it. You're like the rest of the urban areas in the U.S. and you've made it, people have jobs, people are making okay incomes, um, poverty is not too bad. And you can see competitive, transitional, at risk, and distressed are the different levels. Distressed is the worst. We want to try to move, okay, to a different color. And sometimes they do. 
Sometimes they transition from at risk, you know, to at risk and back to distressed based on those indicators. These are poverty, um, educational attainment, and unemployment. The three things I just showed you, they lump those together and they come up with these distressed counties. And you can see the whole area is um, a lot of red on that map. So we have a lot of work to do, which I guess is good for researchers in the region, right? But a little bit depressing as well. Okay, Athens, Ohio. Just to show you where I live, um, if you're looking at the Athens County, and Athens County itself has 64,000 residents. Athens, Ohio, little city within the county, has 20,000 residents. We also have 20,000 students. We don't count them. Sorry, students. You don't get counted in the number um, because they're not permanent residents. So the majority live in Athens City, but there are some sprinkled around the county as well. So if you're looking at high school diploma rates, that's pretty high compared to what I showed you, and the reason for that is what? The university, right? We're the major employer in the county, and we have lots of faculty and staff who I really hope have high school diplomas. <laughs> a lot of them have much higher degrees. So um, we have, you know, we have super over-educated people in Athens. We have administrative associates with master's degrees because jobs are hard to find. So we have really very educated individuals, with, which means everyone outside the university has not so, has, does not have necessarily a high school diploma. Um, so we're good there with the state of Ohio and the rest of the nation. But when you're looking at median household income, faculty don't make a whole lot of money, but we do make more than that. So if you factor that in and take the university out, the rest of Athens County residents are making very little money. And most of them are actually getting government assistance. And so compared to the rest of the state of Ohio and the nation, not doing very well. This is probably one of the worst statistics. A third of the county living in poverty, like I said, and half of all children, meaning half of all children are eligible for student breakfast or school breakfast, school lunches, and a lot of them don't have enough to eat. Very sad that um, they go home on the weekends and they don't have food to eat. And then home ownership, again, another indicator, and certainly we're not doing um, as well there. So that's just a little bit about Athens. Okay, so what comes to mind when you think of Appalachians? Do you think? As everyone probably has you know, seen Beverly Hillbillies and some of the stereotypes, right? Everybody thinks that they're, we're all hillbillies that live there. So, okay, do you know what these people are doing? Bonus points for the person who gets to figure out what they're doing. Moonshine. Yes, okay. How many people in here know what Moonshine is? Anybody heard of it? Okay, anybody seen Moonshiners, that show? Very interesting show. Okay, so in Appalachia, people, not everybody, but some people do make their own alcohol. They make their own whiskey. Um, this is a still right here. Uh, this is a very old still, although I've watched Moonshiners and they're not that much more advanced nowadays. Um, but people do make their own alcohol. It's illegal, not supposed to do it. You can do it and drink it yourself. You can't do it and sell it, okay? But this is very much a part of their cultural heritage. In fact, over Memorial Day weekend, 20 miles from Athens in New Straitsville, Ohio, was the um, the Moonshine Festival. And it was like the 43rd or 44th annual Moonshine Festival where they celebrate their heritage, they show off their ways of making moonshine, but they can't drink it. They have to destroy every ounce that they make. Um, but that just occurred about 20 miles an hour. So this is something that definitely people are still doing or their families still do. We actually had a guy show up to a party um, at our house and brought some of his family shine that they had just made. Um, I didn't try it, I smelled it, and that was enough to turn me off. But there are a lot of people that still do this, but not everybody does, okay? We don't all moonshine. We do not all smoke. We do not all smoke pipes. Um, some people do, and we'll talk about tobacco use in a minute, but not all of us do. We're not all coal miners. However, historically, this is what most people did. So the coal companies came in, they provided people with great jobs and with housing and little um, cities popped up everywhere. There's a coal town just north of Athens. Um, and when the coal dried up, we have 7,000 unabandoned or abandoned mines um, in the state of Ohio when the coal went away. So did the companies that were there working and they left these people with no jobs and they left them with nothing. But there still is coal mining going on. I'm sure you've heard about the coal mine disaster. That's usually when you hear about it. And it's going on in eastern Kentucky and in West Virginia, even a little bit in southern Ohio. But we're not all coal miners, but a lot of people come from coal families. This is a more recent picture in Nelsonville, Ohio, which is about 10 miles north of Athens, high poverty. We don't all live in multi-generational homes, but a lot of, a lot of Appalachians do. 
um, and it's a way of life. The only way they can survive and have enough money to provide food for their family and shelter is to live with lots of people under one roof. But not everybody lives like this. And then of course I have to work in my kids. Um, little Callum, one year old, my big boy, he's almost five, he'll be five, Liam, next month. Um, they are Appalachian. They were born in Athens, Ohio, at the hospital there. They are Appalachian and they're being raised in Appalachia. And um, so not, all of my, not everybody there looks like this either, um, but they are Appalachian as well. So the bottom line is that great diversity in Appalachia and the stereotypes are not necessarily true. So technically, federal definition states, if you live in an Appalachian county, you're Appalachian. So technically, I'm Appalachian. My husband's Appalachian. He was born in New York. He's not Appalachian. I was born in um, Wisconsin. Definitely not Appalachian. If you ask people in Appalachia who are born and raised there, we are definitely not from there. They can smell an outsider. They can pinpoint an outsider, and they would not consider us Appalachian. But for the actual federal definition, currently, I'm Appalachian. Um, but again, separating stereotypes, uh, there's great diversity. If you actually are in uh, Pennsylvania and northern Ohio, there are Amish. And Mennonite communities, going down to the deep south, there's a lot of Latinos and African Americans that live there. The majority of folks, Brandon likes that word, Dr. Brown, yeah, I have to work that in. Um, the people that live where I live, majority are Caucasian. Uh, we do have diversity in Athens County, but that's because of the university. And I should say, like I've talked about before, big income disparities within Appalachia as well as health disparities and definitely disparities between the non-Appalachian and Appalachian. This is one of my favorite quotes from a um, retired faculty member in um, nursing in my same college. And she has really built her entire career around Appalachian culture and diabetes and di um, diabetes prevention in the region. And she says, if you've seen one county in Appalachia, that means you've seen one county. Because these folks grew up in small, little, tiny communities, hollers, hollers, that's what they call them, um, meaning you can holler out the window at one another. Okay, so in the small, Valleys of the mountains, which you have lots of mountains over, around here, so in the valleys, few houses would pop up, especially in coal towns, and you could holler out the window at one another. So that's what they still call their neighbors in the hollers. Um, and so traditions developed in those small little communities, and so what happens even in one part of the county doesn't necessarily happen in another part of the county, which makes it very difficult for intervention development and for research, right? Because it's a very big 420 counties to try to figure out what works in the entire region, it's not possible. So you have to definitely do some community-based um, participatory research to adequately assess and design intervention. Okay, so some of the cultural characteristics of people living in the region, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these in, in a little bit, so I'm gonna go through them fairly quickly right now. But very family-oriented, family is very important in this region, very religious and spiritual. Um, um, if you drive actually from where Athens, Ohio, down into eastern Kentucky, I think you pass more churches than you do actual houses. They may be small churches, but there's a lot of churches. Very attached to place. They actually consider themselves Appalachian, and it's not derogatory for a lot of people living in the mountains to call themselves mountain people. That is how they define themselves. They're really attached to their place. Because one of the things you might think is, well, if it's so bad, why don't people move? Because their grandparents live there. Their great-grandparents. They are attached to place. They really value independence and don't like to help, ask for help from outsiders, which can be a problem, especially regarding health. Um, very kind, friendly, and outgoing. If you had a flat tire on the side of the road, somebody would have to stop and help you. Um, man, woman, it wouldn't matter. Very friendly people. You go to Lowe's or Home Depot and five people want to ask you if you need some help. Um, very different than anywhere else I've lived, for sure. Very patriotic. We've had a lot of people serve in the wars, um, and so they're very proud to be Americans as well. Proud people, they're proud of what they have. They may not have a lot, but they're proud of what they do have. Sometimes they show that by having a lot of stuff in their front yard, but they, they're <laughs> proud of what they have and what they own and um, proud to be Appalachian. And they enjoy good humor and storytelling, which is very important for designing interventions. Storytelling because a lot of them don't have good literacy. So over the years, they've had to pass down information via voice, and so they continue to do that. So what does this mean? It means life is hard for most of the people living in Appalachia, right? People are struggling just to have shelter and put food on the table, um, and, and just about everything else is secondary to that. So I didn't check the internet connection, but I'm gonna hope that this works. So the ABC um, bit of a documentary from Diane Sawyer, just to kind of illustrate 
what these people, how these people are living. Let's see if it works. If I can get the volume up. Oops. Okay, let me pause that one. So can get. Okay, let's try it again. If not, we'll skip it, but. a secret about their mom. I always, I only used to be hooked on drugs. Okay, here we go. We ready? As I went down in the, in the mountains of Appalachia, every child can sing a song, often a song of Jesus. Sister 11 year old Mary tell us a secret about their mom. I'll be honest, I only used to be hooked on drugs and we did not like it when we get. Courtney says she used to lock herself in the bathroom and cry when her mom got high. They bounced from place to place and are grateful they <coughs> have a place to sleep. Her grandparents, where her two uncles, one aunt, three sisters, and her mom's boyfriend Bill also live. There's 12 people living in this house. Honestly, we can barely afford food. Whenever her food stamps are all gone, we, we run out of food. We don't have bread, we don't have meat. Last time we was out of food, the only thing we had in our fridge was butter and ranch. We're not like other people, we can't afford food after food after food. Fruits and vegetables, a rare luxury because of the expense. Their mother's food stamps are $523 a month. Milk runs out fast. Courtney's uncle, called Uncle Duck, puts Pepsi in two-year-old Sable's sippy cup. Courtney is one of those children whose face seems to reach right back across the centuries to the famous portraits by Walker Evans, Doris Ullman, Earl Palmer, where worry and wariness are in the faces of the children, and the adults are ravaged by exhaustion, defeat. Angel, Courtney's mother, is 30 years old. And she says she's trying to stay off drugs and give her children the future they want. So before dawn, she gets them on the 615 school bus. Come on, you got four minutes. Then she and her boyfriend Bill start the trek to the welfare mandated GED class in the center of town. The walk, eight miles, one way. It takes nearly two hours. All I can really do is try to salvage what little bit I can. With a GED, Angel says maybe she could get a job, get off welfare, and have a life like those down the mountain. Okay. okay. Let's see if I can get this back to where I'm going here. Okay. Um, so, just a little snippet of what it's like for a lot of people living in this region. So life is not easy for sure. Okay, get that off of here. Oh, are we, are we screen show ended? There we go, okay. Okay, so bringing this back kind of to a global health perspective, right? From the World Health Organization in 2008 and closing the health, the gap report, the lower the socioeconomic status or position, the worse the health. And while they are certainly talking about a lot of countries in other parts of the world, very true also in the Appalachian region as well. We know from research they just looked at all the counties in um, all of the Appalachian region, and if you are in an economically distressed one of the red counties, you are more likely to have diabetes. So, you've probably all seen this map, right? CDC's diabetes map. 
look at the region, okay? The black are the highest prevalence of diabetes. And this has it at 10% in southeastern Ohio. We have prevalence 15, 16% people. And this is just adults with diabetes. We're now seeing it with kids as well. So at Ohio University, we do have a diabetes research institute that is working very hard in trying to combat this problem because it is so prevalent in the region. So not surprising, then obesity, same thing. If you're looking, oh, wrong button. If you're looking in the region, again, the dark orange or reddish color, 39.32% to 44% obesity are in those red counties. And again, it kind of follows the Appalachian region as well. So obesity is a real problem. And so not just obesity, but then all the other conditions that come with it in addition to diabetes. This is from CDC. Kind of nice that they actually characterize the region. We're now starting to see them actually look at the region as a whole for health um, issues, which they didn't necessarily do even a few years ago. But if you combine the most recent statistics for diabetes and obesity uh, by county, you can see the people that Appalachian region, out of 420 counties, 390 um, have some of the highest levels in the top two quartiles for diabetes and obesity. And then if you look at some of the other regions, um, the South also has very high prevalence as well. Probably not surprising to anyone in this room. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some differences just between Appalachian counties and non-Appalachian counties. And so this is looking at obesity in adults 18 and over. We're looking at Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia. If you look on the left, the darker blue and the salmon color are the Appalachian females and males compared to the non-Appalachian males and females. West Virginia does not have a comparison because they are an entire state the entire state of Appalachia, okay? So if you're looking at close to 35% obesity among Kentucky men, so if we're looking at Ohio, around 30% men and women prevalence of obesity compared to the non-Appalachian counties. Cancer, when you look at cancer incidence and the mortality due to cancer, looking at the Appalachian counties here, so if we're looking at the top three, the rates per 100,000, there's Kentucky, New York, and Ohio. Um, and then if you look at the non-Appalachian, the big issue here is the difference. Okay, not too big when we're looking at the difference of incidence. But when you come over here to mortality differences, the folks in Appalachia are more likely to die due to cancer than the ones in the non-Appalachian region. And part of the reason is because they wait. A lot of them have Medicaid. A lot of them actually have very good, I mean, health coverage is very good because most people are on Medicaid. But they wait until the very end to go to the doctor. So then what are some of the health behaviors actually affecting health? Substance abuse, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Huge issue in the region right now. Tobacco use, physical inactivity, inadequate fruit intake, and late screening behavior. And again, these are just some of them um, that we have some statistics and slides for. So substance abuse, prescription pain use and abuse in the region is super prevalent right now, especially in the West Virginia, Southeastern Ohio, Eastern Kentucky region. Um, the Appalachian Regional Commission did a study a few years ago and looked at the rates. So the dark is the 5.7 to 7.68, right here, the dark blue. They noted in the entire region, if you look at the rates, they're not different from the rest of the United States, but when you break down parts of Appalachia, it's double. The rate is double in Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. And West Virginia has seen a 500% increase in the number of deaths due to uh, prescription drug overdose. So it's a huge issue. Every night we turn on the local news and it's something related to prescription drug use, whether someone's died or people are caught trafficking and selling. Um, they actually called the highway that runs by our house heroin highway because heroin is becoming such a big deal. Because once you've done prescription drugs and you're addicted to opiates, what do you do? Switch to heroin. And so we're starting to see a lot of people switch to heroin. So this is a huge problem right now. I was actually just at a conference just focused on substance abuse in Appalachian. It's a huge issue. Smoking, um, you know, the national, we're down below 20% now, but if you're looking at Kentucky and Appalachian counties, you're looking at Appalachian, Ohio, there are higher almost across the board the number of people that or the percentage of people that are smoking currently. And some of it is related to policy. Kentucky is still not a smoke-free state. Um, Ohio is a smoke-free state. Um, certainly West Virginia is not a smoke-free state, or is Virginia, given that the tobacco fields are in that region. 
This one though is really striking for I don't know or have any idea how um, much people out here use smokeless tobacco or chew, but it is a huge issue in Ohio among Appalachian men. You know, 12, 13% are chewing and thinking that they're safe because they're chewing and not smoking, and then yet they're at risk for esophageal, mouth cancer, et cetera. And it, even compared to the other, they're high across the board, but certainly Ohio has much higher um, prevalence of smokeless tobacco use. And then looking at fruit and vegetable consumption, I think everybody that thinks someone lives in a rural area is a farmer. That is not true. Um, actually, there are initiatives going on right now in Appalachian, Ohio to teach people how to garden and how to can food because that's what their cultural past was, but these newer generations have lost that. And so they're, we're trying to get grandmas to teach their grandchildren how to farm, how to actually can it so that you can store your food and make food and store it for the winter. Um, so looking at inadequate fruit and vegetable consumption, again, higher. Kentucky's doing not so good all around, um, but again, that's higher inadequate in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia is pretty even as well. Probably everybody just needs to be eating more fruits and vegetables in the whole region there. And then no physical activity. This is prevalence of no physical activity whatsoever in the past month um, among adults 18 and older. And you can see that Kentucky, we're at 35 to 40%. Ohio is still pretty high as well, but again, across the board, higher in the Appalachian region. Getting a colonoscopy, Athens um, County has the highest um, colon cancer rate in the state of Ohio, and so this is just one of the preventative screenings, but just showing that most people are not going in to get the preventative care that they need, although in Appalachian, Kentucky, we've got more people who reported getting a colonoscopy than in the non-Appalachian counties, but you can see it's flip-flopped in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. So people are not getting the preventative care that they need. And when they are getting diagnosed, they're dying more um, from cancer. Okay, so what factors influence health in Appalachia? Everybody in this room, good public healthers know this model, right? The social ecological model for health promotion looking at the individual, interpersonal, organizational, community, and policy factors that are contributing to health behaviors and health issues. And so if you're looking at this in our region, one of the first things that comes up is low levels of knowledge. We, I think, as public healthers, assume that people know a lot more than they really do. We don't want to assume that they don't know things, but from the research I've done and going out and talking to people, there's still a lot of misconceptions about a lot of things. Diabetes, for example. People just assume that they get the sugar, that's what they call it down in Appalachia. We get the sugar because we eat too much sugar. There's just a lot of misconceptions and low knowledge about things. Low literacy, like I talked about, a lot of people not graduating from high school, they can't read. So you have to really think about that. I'll talk about that for intervention implications in just a minute. Low health literacy, same thing, plays in, very low health knowledge. And attitudes and beliefs are very prevalent. One of the biggest ones is it's just God's will, okay? There's a lot of apathy and hopelessness for a multitude of reasons. There's just a lot of despair in the region. People just assume that, well, if I'm gonna get diabetes, it's just because that's what God wants. And how do you deal with that when you're trying to intervene if that's what people, how people feel? And we'll talk about that. And pride, people are really proud. They don't wanna ask for help from others. So how do you get them to want to go get healthcare? At the interpersonal level, family is key. You stick to your family before almost everything else. And so decisions are made consulting the family, especially the extended family. And the matriarch actually seems to be the person, Dr. Dunham's research, that the, the grandma or the, the eldest woman in the extended family usually is the one that you go to regarding making health decisions, which would be the opposite that you would think because it seems to be a patriarchal um, society, but it really tends to be the grandma that you go to to ask, especially related to health. Neighbors, super important in influencing your um, health decision making. Like I said, down in the hollers, that's how it's spelled, the hollers. Um, you know, if they're eating something and they're cooking out or they're, they're going to invite you right over. So whatever they're making, you're going to be eating. Um, and social capital, if you don't know the, the that kind of idea it is, can you go ask somebody for some money or for some food if you're in dire need? Can you go borrow $20 from your neighbor if you needed $20? Could you ask them to drive you to the hospital or to the doctor's office? Um, those sorts of things. We do see in Appalachia that social capital is very high. People have trust their neighbors, which doesn't necessarily happen in all the urban areas. So that's an important um, cultural factor. And then looking at where do people congregate? 
Where do they hang out? How does this affect health? Churches. If you are going to try to affect big change in this area, go to where people congregate. It is at church. And not just on Sunday, they go for pigeons. And what do they cook when they go to pigeons? Grandma brings fried chicken, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, all those things that everybody wants to eat but maybe shouldn't, right? So how do you change that? How do you adjust those cultural norms? Schools, a lot of kids, the only place they're eating are at breakfast and lunch at schools. Have you or any of you been to a school lunch or to a school and had lunch or breakfast recently? It's not pretty. We're working on it in the area trying to get farm to, to school, meaning that the, the local um, farmers are bringing fruit and food to the schools so that they can be eating more healthy. There's some pilot studies going on in Eastern Kentucky, but certainly we're not there yet. Work, if you're working in the coal mines, Higher levels of black lung, cancer in the region. Um, they, they tell us, the coal folks say, oh, well, it, it can't be related to working in the coal mines. Really? What else could it be? It's usually among the coal miners. I, I just read a study. It was 78% of all the folks working in that particular coal mine that had some sort of indication that they were going to get black lung in the future. And then this is a key one, celebrations and festivals. People in Appalachia, despite the despair, are they are outgoing, happy people. They like to celebrate every weekend. There is a festival, and I kid you not, just about every weekend of the year. Like I said, it was the Moonshine Festival last <coughs> week. I collected data at the Wild Turkey Festival in Vinton County, Ohio. Um, not, wi not whiskey. Just for some reason, they just labeled it that. And people think, well, why would you go collect data at a festival? Why do you think? Everybody goes. County fairs, we collected data at county fairs um, for a project I was working on, and again, Reviewers, when you send out, they're like, why would you go collect at a county fair? Isn't that very self-selecting? No, it's actually very representative because if you're wanting to get that sample, everybody goes. And they go for multiple days. They go the whole week. Um, so have to think about where people congregate. And then finally, the community level. Now, some of these are individual level cultural, you know, things that affect your attitude, these cultural norms, but I put them in the community level. I know they're not mutually exclusive, but this really steadfast faith in God is something that has to be um, considered. Strong family ties, I've talked about a lot of these, so I'm gonna go through them quickly. Um, pride, self-reliance, fatalism, I think I've already talked about these, sense of place and outside mistrust. And then some of the environmental factors I've already talked about, they're really rugged terrain. I mean, it makes it difficult to actually go for a walk or to be sometimes exercising outside. or They don't have access to gyms, they don't have sidewalks, um, wooded areas, and you assume just because you're in a rural area you should be able to get outside and and exercise, but that's not always the case. Okay, so this is my biggest lesson learned, and this was working in a Department of Energy grant um, in Southern Ohio. We had one of four um, government facilities that was enriching uranium for nuclear weapons. Okay, at the height of its production, it employed 20,000 people in the region. 20,000, that's huge. Government paying jobs that paid really well. Families were able to send all their kids through school, through master's degrees. And then what happened? The Cold War ended. The government stopped needing to enrich uranium. And of course, the jobs ended. Um, and this is in Southern Ohio. So we have this huge facility that's just sitting vacant. And so the government came to us and said, we want you to figure out what the community wants done with this. We're gonna turn the land over to the people and we need to know what sort of cleanup we need to do, environmental cleanup, we need to know what they want. And so this was a survey where we asked people, what do you think is the biggest issue facing the community? I would have said health. Everybody said jobs. Health came to like sixth or seventh down the line. That was really eye-opening for me. I was raised in a family where my mom and dad take care of themselves, we eat healthy, they exercise, and to me that was the first aha moment that, you know what, health is not a priority for most of these people. How does that play into public health? And then, I kid you not, I was putting this together, I was doing a social ecological model, kind of running through my factors, my grad assistant walks in, she's from Appalachia, born and raised, she's about 52 years old, and so she's a non-traditional student, which is rare in Athens. Um, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting together the cultural factors that are kind of, um, you know, influencing health in the region. She said, God, family, self. And I looked at her and I said, what? So I'm not from this region. She said, that's what we're taught when we grow up. God first, then family, then self. Huh, that was another huge eye-opening moment for me. Aha, I've been working out in the region, but if you prioritize yourself third, what does that mean for health and so, here's what you need to think about if you're working in this region. People tell you it's God's will. I've heard it all the time in interviews I've done. I'm going to get diabetes. doesn't matter. It's what God's intended. Okay, how do you intervene there? You say, you know what? You need to take care of yourself. God would want you to take care of yourself. 
And I'm not a very religious person, but my grad assistant said this to me also. Body is the temple of the Lord. Use that. That's in the Bible repeatedly. You need to take care of your body, and you will be, um, you know, taking care of or showing respect or paying homage to, to God. So body is the temple of the Lord. I learned something whenever I put anything together. Think about family first. Use the family. Family is key and ultra important. You have built-in social support networks. So if you can design an intervention that is going to include the family, it is going to be much more likely to succeed. And this is not unique to just the Appalachian region, but they are very family first. So make sure that you're including the family. And then make sure people understand that helping themselves is helping their family. Don't you want to be around? These people sometimes have, when I say these people, Appalachian residents tend to have kids young. Don't you want to be there to see your grandkids and your great-grandkids and be around and live healthy? A lot of them live in multi-generational homes, so don't you want to be there to help out? So you got to think about some of these things when you're designing intervention. Some other things, stress small changes repeatedly, things that we know from public health, but this is really important in this area. They are not going to make huge changes, but if you tell them that they need to park further away at Walmart and walk further, maybe they'll do it and stress it repeatedly. Use storytelling and humor to deliver the messages. We know that that's something from their cultural past that they enjoy, so use it. Teach people to pass on stories at their churches and festivals and tell people that asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It means you're taking care of yourself and doing what you need to support your family and that you can be in control of your own health. So those are some of the intervention implications and I know I'm kind of running out of time. This is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. Some lessons learned from my own research and for planning research. Use a community engaged or community based participatory research approach. If you do not, you will fail in this region. Um, I coming from Atlanta and having worked with people who are HIV positive, coming to a really rural area. I went to, there were consortium meetings for people who are HIV positive in southeastern Ohio and their case managers. I went and just hung out there. It took me about, I, I sat in on meetings for a year and after about two years I finally decided it was time to approach the idea of collecting data and I did and collected a study among just rural Appalachians living with HIV, which is fairly unique. Um, but it can take a long time to gain trust because they know that you're not from around here. My fellow researchers who are from Boston and Jersey, they can be pegged as not from around there really easily. I can fake it better. I'm from Indiana, so I can like throw in the twine when I need to. Um, very important in what I've done for my HIV study going on right now, hire individuals from the region that look like the folks they're going out to collect data from and talk like them. It's very important uh, in this area. This was a huge issue for me, informed consent. People can't read very well. Um, IRB it, it assumes that everybody can read. Ask people if they want to have things read to them or just standardize it. Read it to everyone because here's what people tell me. Show me where to sign. Big, big indicator that they can't read. Or when do I get my money? Or I forgot my glasses. That's the biggest one. I forgot my glasses. Can you just read this to me? So just standardize it, make it, and read it for everyone. This is another one that I never expected. The whole family wants to participate. So we did interviews in Eastern Kentucky and there's supposed to be one-on-one -on -one interviews about diabetes and we get there one morning and there's a woman, she's part of a, um, inter she's gonna be interviewed and there's three of her family members with her and they all wanted to sit in the room with her just to make sure that you know nothing happened that was inappropriate. Was not expecting that and we said no, you know, really with IRB protocol, which we say research protocol, we need to have one-on-one -on -one, and they, they kind of understood, but didn't. But family wants to do things together. I have an HIV testing study right now. People were calling wanting to sign up with their partner. And we said, oh boy, no. Um, you know, of course that's not IRB approved, but could you imagine in high stigma, if one partner tested positive, that person could go home with their partner and be killed. We're like, no, absolutely not. But it's something that I've definitely learned from conducting research in the area. Data collection, dress like your participants. I don't dress like this when I go out to collect data, okay? I wear jeans, t-shirt, um, I talk like they do, I don't use big words, and I don't tell people I'm a researcher, professor, or doctor. In fact, on one of the informed consents, one time I was collecting data and it said doctor on there. They assume I'm a medical doctor and they tell me everything that's wrong with them. I don't need to hear it and I can't help you. So I try to keep that a secret as much as possible. Some people then also close up and won't tell you anything. When we were doing our Department of Energy study, we were in a focus group and a guy said, I don't trust people. And we said, okay, that's fair. I understand why you don't trust people, especially with the government after what they've done with this, you know, enriching uranium and leaving. He said, no, I don't trust you. I don't trust what, I don't understand why you guys are here. Why are you asking this information? And we said, point taken, understood. Um, I probably wouldn't trust us either. People constantly coming in and asking them questions. So it's certainly a wake up call there. 
and have a plan to identify participants who can't read it. Again, there's literacy measures you can use that have four words and you can identify whether or not people can read really quickly. But the forgot my glasses I've heard repeatedly many times um, indication they can't read and have some sort of private room available for data collection if they, if they can't read. And then finally, I've talked about this a little bit, go to where the people are to collect data. You, you try to bring them to campus, that is scary for community folks, especially in our area. They do not want to come to Athens. Athens is a big city, 20,000 people. You live out in one of the you know, tiny towns with two, 300 people, they don't come to Athens unless they, once a month, they come to Walmart to get their groceries. That's it, they don't want to in, forget about campus. That's super scary. Um, I've collected data, except for churches, I've collected data at all these other spots, festivals, county fairs, um, you can read the list there. Um, I have not collected data at laundromats or food pantries, however, for advertising, great places to do so, to reach the population. And have childcare available. A lot of these people aren't working, so they definitely don't have childcare options um, if you can. And finally, with dissemination of results, really important <coughs> that the participants know that you actually care about them. One of the biggest things that happens in Ohio, and I hate to like point out other research institutions, but um, Ohio State tends to come down and collect data a lot. They're not in an Appalachian region. They tend to come down. They have big NIH funding. Collect their data and leave. Same with the University of Cincinnati. Um, and again, with this mistrust, people don't understand why they're coming to ask them questions and are leaving. So we're there in Appalachia, in our back door. We are residents of the area. So if we say, you know what, the data we're collecting is going to help the region, it's going to help us, it's going to help you, we're going to design interventions that are going to be appropriate, that helps build trust and that's going to help you the next time you go about building or conducting your next study. So here we go. I've got my A's and B's backwards, but here we go. We're going back from Ohio all the way back to Irvine, sunny, I hope, California. Um, and I hope you learned a little bit about Appalachia and Appalachian, Ohio, and see that you don't have to go very far. You don't have to go 5,000 miles. You can go 2,000 miles and see people who are living in very similar ways to people over in Africa. So I've enjoyed my time with you, and I know we're about out of time, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, and I know I'll be around for a little bit afterward if you want to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you. Anybody have any burning questions? Well, I, I yeah. Have a oh, yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, the God family uh, cell, uh, it's a very challenging um, cultural set of beliefs to go through for public health reasons that have to do with behavior change. So if every, and I saw in many of the pictures you showed, for example, that many people smoke. Um, and if that's what we do in our family, how do you get in to say um, it's bad for you? If it's uh, sexual behavior, use of condoms, it's, it's not taught, it's, not, it's kind of culture you kind of assume is from observing people, and that's what you are comfortable with. And I wonder if you can share with us some of your observations as to what's been effective in getting through this yeah. shell. It's very difficult. In fact, um, so uh, Sharon Dunham, who's, doing, who's done a lot of work in the area and is from Appalachia originally, is working with faith-based organizations right now. She's CDC funded to be doing some work in the area um, from the whole Appalachian region from Ohio all the way down to Mississippi. And it's a five-year project and she's having, um, she's getting churches on board, but very difficult to try to infiltrate the churches. Um, these beliefs and attitudes are so deep-rooted, and I think part of the, the problem is that people in this area, so many bad things have happened, and <coughs> they don't trust people, and they just assume things are just gonna happen, and that's just, it's God's will, it's this apathetic hopelessness, and well, you know what, if I get, lung cancer from smoking, that's just what's supposed to happen to me. Grandpa died of it, you know, he lived to 47. If I lived to 47, that's fine. Because um, they don't feel like they have a whole lot to live for. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to intervene. But things that have been successful are interventions that have included the family. So making sure that you're not just changing one person's diet or trying to get one person to smoke, but really incorporating the entire family. Um, as well as the few studies that have been done are the ones that can really get someone on board from a faith-based community um, and getting a key leader there at the church to really be instrumental in getting information for those kind of helpful. But there's still a lot of work to be done. There, there has not been enough done in the Appalachian region 
to even know necessarily what has been super successful. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, those are the same three hierarchical shells you find in many African communities. Exactly. It's very, very similar. Very similar. And we say that all the time, though, that anyone who's been to Africa, very similar. So, um, but we're, you know, we're hopeful. Everybody there, I think, you know, is hopeful that we can improve the quality of life in the region. But it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of work. And some things that are not easy to fix, like educational attainment and jobs, bringing jobs into the region. A lot of the, a lot of the economic development folks, if you can fix some of those things, some of these other things are going to fix themselves. Um, by getting more money pumped into the region for taxes and better schools and all that, but those are not easy fixes. So, um, and, and one thing I found in my own research is that people want to learn the information. HIV study I'm running right now, we're doing an intervention, and we're doing one-on-one -on -one counseling with people and then asking them to be tested, is that they want to learn. They want to know these things. They want to get an HIV test. They don't have access. In the county I live, there's only one place to get an HIV test, that's Planned Parenthood. Um, there's no other spots in the county to do so. And the home act, the home kit costs forty dollars, so a lot of people don't have access to it. But they want a lot of times the information; they just don't have access to it or the resources to um, get the provider the health care they need. So it's complex, yeah. super complex. More work for you. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of work for me. That's right. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Well.